very warm welcome um, everybody to today's um, departmental um, seminar. It is a great um, pleasure to have Evelyn Huber um, speaking to us today. Um, Evelyn is um, a professor um, of political science um, at the University of North Carolina Chapel Hill, or more specifically the, the Moorhead Alumni Distinguished Professor of um, Political Science. Um, it says political science in her, her job title, and I also believe her PhD was in political science, but I think um, that doesn't quite do her full justice, because I think looking at um, Evelyn's um, research and also today's paper, I think, so that she is a, is a colleague who, well, traveled more than possibly any, um, very elegantly between political science and sociology. And, um, and I think um, that um, um, stands out for me and this makes her work um, very, very exciting. Also in terms of my, my own development as a, as a student and also my teaching, I think a huge impact had her um, 2001 book, which I guess sort of dates me a little bit, um, on the development and crisis of the welfare state, which I think um, was um, quite, quite fascinating from a methodological point of view, the way it combined the quantitative analysis of um, social policy with an in-depth knowledge of, um, of case studies. So Evelyn is... Um, um, a Latin American, as I guess one could say, um, but at the same time is equally um, comfortable looking um, at post-industrial economies across the OECD, whether they're in Europe um, or all the way in Australia and um, or, or New Zealand and even um, East East Asia. So here. Um, 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 a track record of of research that I think is is most um, most impressive, and that made me quite exciting that we could um, win her to present um, this week to us in the departmental seminar series a paper I guess that belongs more into the sociology part of the research rather than the um, the political science part. Um, but still, even for a political scientist like me, um, rather exciting because she will be looking at social rights and how social rights have changed in, um, well, economies becoming more and more um, post-industrial. So specifically to focusing today on poverty of the working age population with some um, discussion of, of inequality um, um, as well. Um, but I guess um, I shall stop here and hand over to um, to Evelyn for her to start, and also I guess a lot of um, questions um, later. So I shouldn't crowd out the, the question time by talking too much at um, at the beginning. So Evelyn, please, um, um, the floor is yours. And um, many thanks for joining us from from Chapel Hill, where I think it is lunchtime at the moment, isn't it? Uh, that is correct, yes. <laughs> and uh, thank you, Timo, for the introduction, for the invitation. It's a great pleasure to kind of be there with you, uh, but uh, it certainly is much better for my carbon footprint uh, to do it on Zoom. So I'm looking forward to your comments and questions. Uh, the, uh, the, what I'm presenting today is uh, partly finished work and partly work in progress. The part on poverty uh, has been published in Social Forces. The part on inequality will be uh, in our book in progress. So that is ongoing work. So essentially what we are asking is, uh, what has happened to poverty among the working age population in post-industrial democracies over the past half century, okay? Uh, in particular, we are looking at working, uh, working age households, and we are doing this because we are looking at market income 
and then at uh, lowering poverty in market income, then lowering of poverty. Uh, and if we take the whole population, then this greatly exaggerates market income poverty among the elderly in countries with very generous pension systems. So therefore our uh, focus on the working age population. Uh, we want to know how over time welfare states have reduced poverty, how welfare states have changed in their effects on poverty, and then we will ask the same questions about inequality. All right, uh, this is a uh, literal Wagnerian wall of figures, and I uh, apologize, so let me just walk you through the essentials. Uh, what we are interested in is uh, starting with disposable income poverty. We see that from pre-2000 uh, to now, uh, the average in every welfare state uh, regime type, Nordic, Western, Southern, Anglo-American, uh, disposable income poverty has increased. We see that poverty reduction has decreased uh, in, uh, uh, in uh, again, in all uh, welfare state regime types, except for the liberal ones, where it has always been uh, pretty low. But by the way, if we take out, oh, we did take out Ireland, right. Uh, okay, uh, Ireland is an outlier. I, Ireland is doing a lot more. Um, all right, uh, a little bit about uh, uh, comment on the data. We pool data from three sources, the Luxembourg Income Study, the OECD, and uh, Eurostat, uh, SILK, Statistics on Income and Living Conditions. So we have almost tripled the number of observations compared to past analyses. Okay. Uh, all right, uh, here are our master variables. Uh, uh, the find, uh, for, for, uh, these are the master variables concerning market income uh, poverty and politics. And, and by the way, we use a relative measure uh, of poverty. We use the OECD convention of 50% of median income. All right. All right, so uh, a, a brief comment here on hypotheses concerning politics and policy. So uh, the finding that prolonged left incumbency both shapes labor markets and welfare states for the relative benefit of workers uh, is well established. Uh, if we look at labor market institutions, uh, we clearly see that union density has declined across the post-industrial world, but important cross-country differences remain. Moreover, the institutionally anchored position of labor uh, continues to afford important and differential influence on wages. Uh, a, a good source for that is uh, Baccaro and Howell. So uh, of particular interest with respect to poverty is the minimum wage level. So union involvement in minimum wage setting pushes the minimum wage upwards and improves the income position of workers at the bottom. Uh, now, importantly, when we are looking at welfare state benefits, we are measuring social rights, not expenditures. In past work, we didn't have those social rights measures, so we used expenditures. But the problem uh, with expenditures is it conflates policy or generosity and need, right? If need goes up at any given level of generosity, spending will go up. Uh, so uh, uh, here we have a, a, a much better measure from Scruggs, uh, non-aged welfare generosity is operationalized using an index of sickness and unemployment benefits 
and parental leave is measured as the average replacement rate of parental leave benefits in the first year. Uh, human capital spending measures public spending on education, daycare, and active labor market policies as a percentage of GDP. And finally, education is operationalized as percentage of the adult population with less than completed secondary education. Okay. So we would expect a positive association of our education measure with uh, poverty. All right, uh, and here are uh, our main need variables. That is variables that shape pre-tax and transfer poverty and thus the need for redistribution, right? Once we control for generosity of benefits. Uh, the economic structure and demographics all shape the volume of work that households are likely to perform and the level of pay for that work. Um, uh, right, so children in single mother households predict lower volumes of work performed by these households, deindustrialization, uh, predicts uh, uh, lower pay for the volume of work that is being performed because the industrialization destroyed relatively well-paying jobs for low-skill individuals. Um, all right, finally, globalization, we mainly have in there as controls uh, because the literature talks about it uh, a lot. They are all in some way or other supposed to tilt the balance of payment at the balance of power. I'm teaching about the IMF and the balance of payment. So that was a little slip right there. So uh, the balance of power uh, towards capital and to reduce jobs for low skilled workers. All right, so here are our results. Uh, what we did was we enter variables in groups having to do with here, uh, politics and labor market institutions, policy, globalization, and then need variables. And we uh, bring forward into the final model uh, all the variables that are significant uh, earlier. Uh, so these are praise Winston estimations, which calculate panel corrected standard errors and correct for first order autoregressiveness. We do control for common economic shocks with period dummies, uh, but to make the table more readable, we don't uh, show them. Um, so the, the final model, as you can see, has a good fit. It explains 70% of the variation. So I'll just focus on that model. Uh, as expected, uh, union involvement in minimum wage setting uh, is significantly negatively associated with market income poverty. Parental leave benefits are positively associated. Uh, with market income poverty, but they are supposed to be. In other words, they are supposed to be an incentive for people to go on leave and therefore not have uh, any income. Uh, by non-aged welfare state, generosity has an impact on pre-tax and transfer poverty. It's not uh, completely obvious. Uh, one factor is probably uh, a, uh, a lessening of the scarring of unemployment uh, over time. Uh, because, of course, uh, generosity uh, doesn't change very radically from, from one year to the next. So uh, it stays uh, pretty, well, as we will see, it doesn't stay completely constant, but still over the longer run, more generous systems uh, make it more possible for people to maintain their skills, doesn't force them to accept jobs way below their skill levels. 
Um, so third world uh, tr trade openness is associated with pre-tax and transfer poverty. Then uh, unemployment, as we would expect, percent of children in single mother households, uh, and finally, overall employment levels are negatively associated with poverty because it means there is a greater volume of work uh, in the society. Uh, all right, here we are looking at the substantive importance of our variables. Uh, in other words, our figures show the effect of a two standard deviation change in the independent variable on the dependent variable. Uh, so I will come back to panel B. Uh, let's just look at panel A for now. Uh, we can see that uh, for uh, market, the, the most important variables for market income poverty are children in single mother households and trade openness. On the other hand, employment has a very substantively uh, negative effect. And again, unemployment is important. Um, so this is uh, pretty much as we would expect uh, uh, in, in a uh, uh, kind of from the point of view of what we know of the impact of economics and or economic structural labor markets and demographics on uh, poverty. So let's turn to poverty reduction. Uh, as I said before, if we control uh, for generosity, as we do, then need obviously will drive up poverty reduction, right? Uh, so children in single mother families, unemployment, overall employment levels and industrial employment, we uh, expect to drive up the, uh, or to be associated with the need for poverty reduction and therefore with actual poverty reduction. In policy, our uh, welfare state generosity and parental leave benefits, we expect to reduce uh, poverty. And finally, uh, in politics, left and Christian democratic government have been shown before to be associated with lower poverty levels. Therefore, we expect them to be associated with poverty reduction. Uh, same thing uh, for uh, women in parliament. And by the way, we expect the political effect because clearly there are more policies than what we can, or what we have uh, measures for here with our uh, social rights, uh, in particular social services uh, that make it easier, for instance, for children in single mother families uh, 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 for mothers with, for single mothers with children to uh, engage in paid work. So therefore, we expect a residual uh, political effect. Uh, the same thing goes for women in parliament. Uh, uh, typically, uh, women have been shown in parliament to show more concern for women's issues, children's issues, and so on, and in general uh, for poverty. And finally, we have uh, veto points. Uh, veto points, uh, that's a composite measure for presidentialism, bicameralism, federalism, and the regular or, or usual use of referenda. And uh, those, if you have a lot of veto points, that makes it harder to pass a significant legislation uh, of, of any kind, but specifically uh, in our uh, case here, what is of interest is legislation for poverty reducing policies. And here are our results, uh, same setup as for pre-tax and transfer poverty. Again, uh, uh, praise Winston regressions, uh, variables uh, entered in groups, the significant variables uh, carried forward. And as you can see, 
uh, again, our, uh, uh, our results are pretty much uh, as expected. We find that need variables, uh, that is children in single mother households, low levels of employment, uh, along with social rights and politics, social rights, uh, parental leave benefits, non-aged welfare generosity, and the politics, uh, Christian democratic government, uh, and veto points negatively, uh, all shape uh, poverty reduction. Now, uh, clearly the surprise is the failure of left government to reach significance. Uh, and uh, uh, of course, left governments, uh, so this is in contrast to previous studies uh, of both disposable income poverty and poverty reduction, that is our own earlier article, our 2003 article, where we, uh, and 2014, where we found that social democratic incumbency was significant and generally stronger than Christian democratic uh, government. However, of course, social democratic government works very heavily through our uh, uh, measures of uh, welfare state generosity. If you want to see those models, I can show them in the Q&A. Uh, I, I want to uh, move to uh, the comparison over time. But before we get there, uh, let's go back to the substantive importance of our variables. And this is now panel B here on poverty reduction. We can see that uh, non-aged welfare state generosity, again, this is Crocs's index of generosity of unemployment benefits and sick pay, uh, is the substantively most important variable in reducing poverty. Uh, the second most important is percent and a need variable, uh, children in single mother households. And then we have employment and veto points uh, and parental leave benefits as uh, important variables as well. All right, uh, let's have a look at the important question of uh, how welfare states have changed in the needs they are addressing, right? And here we look at all three dependent variables, market income poverty, poverty reduction, and disposable income poverty. And <clears throat> we, we divide the sample uh, uh, in the year 2000. So uh, this is up to 2000, the first one, and the second one is after 2000s. So uh, for our social rights variables, the, uh, the effects uh, remain uh, pretty constant over the two periods for all three dependent variables. Okay. Welfare state generosity is highly significant and substantively important for poverty reduction and uh, disposable income poverty in both periods. It is the substantively most important variable in the pre-2001 period for poverty reduction and in both periods for disposable income poverty. Unemployment is the substantively second strongest variable for poverty reduction in the earlier period, but it loses significance in the later period. It is not significant for disposable income. Uh, uh, it is not for disposable income poverty in the earlier period, but it becomes significant in the later period. This suggests that the welfare state successfully compensated for unemployment in the earlier period, but has been less successful in the later period. In contrast, children in single mother households uh, was not significant uh, in the earlier period. Uh, and it was the substan, uh, wait a minute. Uh, uh, 
Oh, it was the substantively most important uh, variable associated with market income poverty in the earlier period. Uh, it was not associated with poverty reduction in the period, but is so in the later period. Uh, so uh, it, it becomes uh, in the later period, as we saw in our previous graph, uh, it becomes the uh, variable most strongly associated with poverty reduction, and it is not associated with disposable income poverty. These results indicate that welfare states have reoriented to some extent their focus from unemployment compensation to support for children and work family conciliation policies or from old to new social risks. All right, let me spend, uh, I, I was told to talk for about 40 minutes, so uh, I will spend the last 10 minutes in uh, 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 looking at inequality. This is pretty much the same setup uh, that we uh, had uh, for our uh, 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 poverty uh, analysis. Again, we are looking at pre-tax and transfer income inequality. We are looking at redistribution or lowering of inequality and disposable income inequality. And uh, we see a remarkably similar story, which is not really surprising since we were analyzing relative poverty. Okay. Now we know that the Gini responds to uh, much more to uh, developments in the middle of the income distribution. So it's not entirely the same, but we would expect them to be related. So everywhere market income inequality goes up. Uh, and so does disposable income inequality. Okay. Uh, this is also true in the liberal countries. The redistributive effort clearly goes up in the southern European countries. It goes up very slightly in the liberal countries and uh, uh, even the continental countries, uh, but it clearly goes down in the Nordics. The Nordic countries remain the least unequal uh, in disposable income inequality, but the gap to the next group, the continental countries, has shrunk. Southern Europe remains the most unequal, uh, but the increase in the liberal countries has narrowed the gap. And the United States has the distinction of ending up with the most uh, unequal uh, income distribution with a, a genie of disposable uh, income of roughly 38. Uh, that's uh, getting close to uh, some of the uh, best of the Latin American countries. All right, uh, again, uh, here are our models and uh, same procedure. And there are no real surprises here. Uh, wage dispersion, in other words, these are the variables that influence wage dispersion. Uh, wage dispersion is clearly, uh, as we would expect, associated with uh, market income uh, inequality. Uh, model, uh, as I said, model seven here, uh, the minimum wage setting uh, is very strongly uh, related to it also by shaping, uh, uh, or th this is picked up here a lot uh, through the uh, wage dispersion measure. Um, here uh, we see that uh, Oh, uh, yes, so uh, what uh, model seven has a further uh, significant coefficient for human capital spending. Again, human capital spending, we would expect to affect wage dispersion. 
so the reason for keeping those separate for not just using wage dispersion, but rather showing the effect of minimum wage setting and human capital spending, the reason for that is because those are policy variables, institutional variables that can be manipulated, right? Uh, that's uh, the, the reason for showing them separately. Uh, so uh, it is, uh, again, volume of work and remuneration of work as indicated by wage dispersion. Then we have the same unemployment and employment uh, and the percentage of uh, children in single mother families that shape uh, uh, pre-tax and transfer inequality. And here is our uh, analysis of uh, redistribution. Uh, and again, uh, we see once we are controlling uh, for the benefits, then need is very important. Uh, that is children in single mother households. Uh, our parental leave benefits are important and in particular uh, non-aged welfare state generosity. Uh, and we see a strong association with veto points. In other words, the, the, uh, the, the dispersion of constitutional power that makes it uh, easy for opponents of redistributive policy uh, to exercise uh, veto power. And finally, the same look, uh, yeah, I have a few more minutes, uh, the similar, a uh, very similar pattern of uh, change over time as we saw in poverty. The need variables of uh, children in single mother households uh, right here, does not drive up redistribution in the early period. It does in the second one. Uh, it is significantly associated with disposable income poverty in the earlier period, not in the second one. In other words, it's even uh, wrongly signed. Uh, the unemployment rate does not significantly affect right here, uh, does not significantly affect disposable income inequality in the earlier period, but it does so in the later period. Uh, so uh, uh, again, uh, employment also loses significance in the later period. So it's really remuneration at the bottom unemployment and welfare state generosity that shape disposable income inequality in the more recent period. Uh, and again, we see how uh, the, uh, the welfare states in the more recent period uh, address the problem of children in single mother households more effectively than they did in the uh, earlier period. Uh, all right, and with that, I thank you for your attention, and I'll be happy to answer your questions. Well, thank you very much, um, um, Italy. And, oh, Berkey, the first hand goes up straight away. And Berkey, please. Uh, Sorry, Timo, you are quite far away. I don't know whether I'm the only one who's... Having a hard time okay, yes, now I'm, I moved the microphone down again. Let's see. What's the wrong angle? Thanks for pointing that out, Burke. Please um, it, um, shoot. So, yeah, so thank you so much for a very, very interesting talk. Um, so I missed the first a few mi uh, minutes uh, at the beginning. So sorry for that. Maybe that you clarify this point before. You know, like when, when you were presenting your results in the old discussion, it reminds me that uh, I was the RA uh, research assistant for the chapter written by Gustav Spin Anderson and John Miles on the Oxford Handbook of Economic Inequality when they talk about how welfare states shape the inequality. When I was doing the RA work, the, the big discussion was taking place at that stage is a lot, of, a lot of those features that we think that come together as a welfare state are endogenous to inequality itself in a way. And the chapter, if I remember correctly, starts with writing and like with that disclaimer saying that 
uh, parts of these arms of welfare states, tools and policies come together, are being fed by the existing inequalities and they shape the existing inequalities. So there's a feedback effect loop going, going through. And then we did exactly the similar analysis, pre-market income, like this market income, disposable income, and the redistribution on a graphical term in that chapter, which was uh, the debate back then in 2009. And I was wondering, what would you say if someone says, you know, like some of these factors that we think that we are controlling for are already responding to existing inequalities and, and poverty measures that you look at in certain ways. And then that endogenous relationship is hard to capture whether we should be controlling for them or whether we should not be controlling for them. What would you say in general to that argument that uh, some of these analyses are like becoming at some point is, is a bit of a circular in that sense? Well, I would ask somebody to clarify the endogeneity chain. In other words, what is it about inequality that shapes the welfare state uh, uh, configuration? Uh, now, I, I, I can uh, right off the bat, uh, I can say in more unequal countries, we, we know, well, we know there is in many countries a difference in political participation uh, across socioeconomic strata, right? Uh, now, we also know from comparative political behavior that where you have strong civil society organizations that can compensate for that. So in the old days, when you had very strong unions, uh, unions could draw in uh, uh, lower education, lower income people into political participation. So uh, uh, even at that, institutions still matter, right? And so uh, I, I still think it is, we, we can ask how were welfare states constructed, and we have done that in, in earlier work. In other words, welfare states are co politically constructed over decades, and uh, so, yeah, it, right, there is a feedback effect, but it still makes sense to cut into that feedback loop and to demonstrate the, uh, what a good policy can do in terms of uh, reducing uh, poverty and inequality. Thank you so much, yeah. Anybody else having a question? Tom. Uh, yeah, that was a really helpful uh, talk. I, I was just, I was really struck by one of the points you made on unemployment, actually. And I was just wondering if you could expand on that because um, you were comparing the effects pre and post 2000. Um, and, 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 and I think the conclusion you drew was around the welfare state and the way that that reacts and supports unemployment. But um, is it possible, and maybe, maybe this is something you accounted for, that the change was actually due to the nature of unemployment and that actually the way that that reflects disadvantage has changed? Uh, and I was just wondering if you could expand on that slightly and say a bit more. Well, so if we look at the uh, generosity of welfare state, uh, I'm sorry, the generosity of unemployment compensation, we see that it has gone down in most countries. Okay, in other words, the replacement rate has gone down. Uh, in many countries, you have uh, uh, like tougher qualifying conditions. In other words, people have to have been in, in work uh, for longer. Uh, we have an, an other thing in many countries, the, uh, the tops have been frozen. Uh, so you have had a compression downward uh, in unemployment benefits. Uh, so, yeah, the, the, the benefit structure clearly has become less generous uh, as unemployment has become a longer lasting and bigger problem. That is, rates were higher and the higher rates have uh, lasted longer. Uh, did that answer your question or was... Yeah, yeah, okay. I think that clarifies a bit actually around what the model was showing, actually. That's really helpful. Thank you. Okay. 
Anybody? If not, I have a question. Oh, Eva first, and I wait until. Yeah. Thank you. Um, I have a, I have two uh, small questions. The first one was that. Um, so you mentioned that you combine different data sources uh, like silk and other data sets, and you showed you were looking at trends in in poverty and inequality over time. I was just wondering how um, comparable these data sources are over time, and whether um, uh, yeah you, you you've been looking at the consistency of these data sources. Um, Another question I had was about um, this indicator of non-aged welfare state uh, generosity. I, I missed how exactly it was uh, created, but you mentioned, I think, that it captures sickness and unemployment benefits. And I was just wondering whether uh, we should be also looking at other welfare payments, such as uh, family benefits or social assistance benefits, uh, and how they are designed, because obviously they will have uh, an important role for um, poverty reduction and redistribution. And just finally, if I may, um, when you talk about um, redistribution, I, I thought that perhaps also the design of uh, the income taxation would be quite important um, in affecting uh, levels of income inequality, and whether that's something that you could consider. I'm sorry, the, the design of what? Uh, income taxation. Oh, oh, right, right, right. For example, top marginal tax rates. Um, okay. and so, yeah, the, say the progressivity of the income tax schedule. Right, right, right. Okay, those are all good questions. So uh, first, uh, the uh, uh, yes, the data are compatible, but it, it takes quite a bit of work. Uh, so, uh, and what we did was, when we had list data available for those data points, that's what we used. Uh, then uh, we added the silk data for the missing. Silk and list are very compatible. Uh, it's the OECD that uh, is, is somewhat more problematic. Uh, and we used the OECD data only when list and silk were unavailable. And uh, of our 374 observations, 74 come from the OECD series. So uh, uh, anyway, there, there is some adjustment one has to uh, make in, in looking at them, but uh, it, it is possible. Uh, okay, the generosity index uh, we got from Lyle Scrox. Uh, Lyle's Crux uh, includes in uh, this particular index uh, a, a unemployment and sickness, and he codes those, he constructs an index that takes into account uh, replacement rate and qualifying conditions and duration. Uh, and uh, you are absolutely right that it would be good to have all those other data uh, on uh, social assistance, housing, uh, and so on. And obviously, if we had that, we would get an even bigger effect on uh, poverty reduction and inequality reduction. The problem is those data are not easily comparable. Uh, there is a minimum income benefit uh, data set uh, by, uh, uh, put together by Kenneth Nelson and others at SOFI, uh, the Stockholm uh, Institute. Uh, again, it's whatever. Uh, so uh, we decided not to use it. Uh, for one thing, it uh, doesn't have the uh, time coverage that we would want. Uh, so anyway, theoretically, you are entirely right. It would be good to have all that. In practice, the data are just not available for the time period we want it in a comparable form. 
Uh, and then finally, uh, yes, if we took into account taxation, um, actually, uh, there is a uh, there is a paper and that looks at what amount of redistribution is affected through the tax system versus expenditures. And the evidence is overwhelming that by far the biggest part of redistribution happens through expenditure. In other words, very few tax systems are really redistributive. In other words, most are uh, close to neutral, uh, maybe slightly progressive, in other words, slightly redistributive, uh, but it's the expenditure side that is massively redistributive. Uh, if you want to, I'll, I will find the reference uh, for that paper. I just can't recall it uh, right now. Send me an email afterwards if you want it. Is there another hand? Um, anybody with a question? <laughs> if not, I have um, um, a comment or a question. What I think is intriguing that you show that um, welfare state effort has quite clearly changed. Um, so changes in the redistributive effort, but also the, the risks that are um, 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 effectively attended, but at the same time, you show the, the disappearance of partisan effects, but highlight um, the great importance of the institutional context for policy making. So, if a policy making context is um, more, more difficult with a lot of reach opportunities, it, it shapes the outcomes rather than who sits in the driving um, seat. Does this and suggest? Um, a convergence of um, political parties, that the centre-right and um, centre-left are somewhat becoming more and more um, um, similar and struggle with the same challenges um, in their political systems, rather than um, struggle with ideology. So that is partly true, but even more important is the... Uh, or the changes in the party systems that have made coalition governments more necessary. In other words, uh, right, the, the one party government has become, or two party of closely aligned parties has become increasingly the exception. And mostly we have fairly broad coalition governments and so that accounts for the, the lack of partisan effects on, on policy. Uh, in addition to that, so you are, of course, you are right. There has also been a partial, uh, so it, let's take Germany, right? Uh, so the SPD implements the Hartz reforms. And on the other hand, the CDU, CSU implements the uh, gender egalitarian policies. So there we definitely see a rapprochement, but also we see they have been in coalition a lot of times uh, since 2000. So, and we see the same kind of combination in a number of other countries. And if you observe the, um, the greater occurrence of um, coalition governments, can these be seen as a result of um, 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 new social risk groups? So the groups, the welfare state is shifting to becoming more prominent because the greater um, or the larger the new social risk groups, the more um, the traditional parties struggle to, to unify the constituencies and then remain hegemonic, applying to both the, the centre-right and the centre-left. Center Again, I think that's part of the answer. I would add to this the immigration backlash and the rise of the far-right, right? So we have seen uh, changes in party systems due to other factors. So the uh, uh but certainly uh yeah 
uh, in other words, the, the two are linked, right? The anti-immigration backlash is linked to insecurities of the losers from globalization, which then is linked to what you are talking about, and that is the different risk groups and their relationships to different political parties. Uh, but I mean, on, on kind of phenomenologically, what we see is a splintering of party systems, the emergence of a whole bunch of new parties, um, part, mostly the right, but partly also the left, clearly with the Greens and the Liberal Greens and so on and so forth. So. Uh, and that uh, that obviously mutes the impact of any one party on policy. Thank you. Um, anybody else with a question? Oh, Berke is back in business. Um, Berke, please. Unless there's somebody else um, who wants to jump in, in front of the queue before Berke takes a second dip. Please, if anyone has. Nobody? I'm happy Berke, go for it. Thank you. I'm so sorry. No, so, don't be. Uh, Ellen, sorry for the, coming back to, with, a, with a question around the same similar topic, because I think what you just said to Timo's question is a good example of type of feedback effect that I was actually thinking about, which is the migration that you use as a control in your right hand side. Can we just really think that the migration was entirely free from the welfare state's own configurations, for example, like why do, do we think that, in, especially in the refugee migration, that they chose Germany rather than other countries? And so that political process is somewhat that feeds to one of some of these factors that we think on the right hand side should be. And, and I, I thought that your example for migration was a clear, clear illustration of it, that it didn't happen randomly, that the migration happened in certain ways to certain countries compared to others. like. I, I don't know, I just thought that maybe, what would you think about that? Um, well, so is the question, what do I think countries with generous welfare states are more attractive to migrants? Yes, uh, no, no doubt about it. Uh, yeah. So, and uh, countries have struggled with that I would say more politically than financially, uh, uh, right? I mean, yes, the welfare state has become a real fiscal burden, but uh, it uh, most of the kind of north of Italy, most of the countries north of Italy have done relatively well economically. And so uh, that, that has been, this was economically manageable, but it created uh, major political problems. That's right. Right. So, yeah, I guess my point was basically, uh, if we think that migration did not happen uh, randomly across, like, the welfare states here, and it's, and their development, like, and their response to poverty is some of one of the reasons why migration is happening in that way, then potentially that we probably, I would be curious whether we should be putting them in their regression estimations of under poverty on the right hand side, whether that's the right place to control for them. Uh, because they like it, like themselves very much is a response to the poverty alleviation problems. And, and it, like, that's exactly the example of endogeneity that worries me uh, in, in that setting. But maybe, yeah, that's, yeah. So that's, I just well, want to highlight as an example. Sorry, I don't want to hijack the conversation or discussion, so. Uh, that's, uh, everything in the social world is connected to everything else. All right, there is no way around this and no type of fancy statistical analysis gets you around that basic fact, uh, right? So uh, you do the best as you can with the methods that are generally accepted and you complement that with uh, comparative case studies. So in our uh, book in progress, we are looking in depth at Germany, uh, Spain, Sweden, and the United States. And we look at how, how you know, those, the interplay of the politics, the policy, and the uh, uh, outcomes. Perfect. Thank you so much. Sure. We are a 
approaching six o'clock, but if there is still somebody who, who wishes to ask, I think we can still squeeze in a couple of questions if there is um, the wish to ask. So we don't need to be too Teutonic on, on timekeeping if there is an interest. No? Well, then, um, 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 return to Teutonic um, and leave the volunteerism behind. Um, but um, thank you so much, um, Evelyn, for, for your presentation. Um, um, very, very intriguing findings and also something to, to think about in terms of the policy political application and then also at Sperke, um our man for the methods also then methodologically really a lot to to think about and it was a, a really great pleasure to have you present um, this paper here to us well tonight here in in the UK and um, lunchtime um, in in the United States um, thanks so much Right. Thank you, Timo, and thank you all for your uh, uh, very uh, good questions and for your interest. And uh, all the best to everybody, and may the virus die out. <laughs> yes, indeed. <laughs> thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.